morning, everyone, and welcome to our first talk of this talk year of this PSCAN year. seminar series. Uh, it's my pleasure that today we are joined by Professor Pete Burner from Cardiff University. Uh, Pete is a professor of data science and cybersecurity at the Cardiff University. He is a director of Cardiff NCSC EPSRC Academic Center of Excellence in Cybersecurity Research. He leads AI for cybersecurity research at Airbus DTO on a part-time basis. He has been involved in grants worth 23 million. He's leading large awards from EPSRC, ESRC, and industry on cybersecurity analytics, fusion of AI, cybersecurity, and risk. And he also sits on the UK government AI council. Um, today, he is going to talk about AI for cybersecurity innovation. Um, so, Pete, when you are ready, please start. Okay, great. Yeah, so, morning, everyone, and uh, thanks thanks for the invitation. Um, yeah, so my plan today is I'm going to just give you an overview, really, about what, what our team does at Cardiff University generally in terms of cybersecurity, just out of interest in case there are any potential overlaps and links for collaboration. Um, but also to put the work that we do, in, the work I'm going to talk about today around AI cyber innovation in the context of the the grander scheme generally, but also, again, as, as the research that we do. Um, so I'll give an overview of that and then I'll walk through a few examples of, of how we've looked at machine learning in, in the context of cyber security for, for good and for bad and sort of really to try to interrogate the possibilities and limitations of machine learning in this context of uh, cyber defence. Um, so first of all, about uh, the, the, the Center for Cybersecurity Research at Cardiff University. So um, we're about 50 FTE now, and we're very broad in the uh, disciplines that are involved. Um, computer science obviously plays a big part in this, you know, be, being cybersecurity, but we've got a growing presence in psychology in particular, looking at human factors, which I'll go into in a, in a short while. Um, criminology as well has also got a, a, a decent number and you know, one or two individuals in law and politics in the business school. Um, so this slide represents effectively the work of 50 FT, which is always going to be really, really difficult to capture. But this is really a high level overview of the kind of things that we do and how it all hangs together. So if I start with the the uh, the, the blue box to the left hand side of the screen, risk assessment and modeling, um, risk assessment. Normally, you would look at your um, assets in your organization. You'd look at the vulnerabilities of those assets. You'd look at threats that might exploit those vulnerabilities, and then you calculate the overall impact of that, um, which is the well, traditional, I suppose, way of doing things. But two limitations with that is, one, um, with cyber attacks, it's really hard, actually, to capture all the threats because the landscape is changing all the time. Um, and then when you have an unknown threat, it's hard to actually work out what to do with it because you haven't predicted that risk. So that leads into the other part, which is um, is that trying to track your uh, assets individually and understand the threats to those and the impact of the attack on those uh, assets individually doesn't really allow you to understand the cascading impact of a cyber attack on one particular component or one part of your system on other components and other parts of your system. So when you combine that then with cyber attacks potentially being unknown and, and unseen, uh, then you suddenly get an attack on a particular component or subsystem and you can't understand how that's going to impact the rest of your system. It's a complete nightmare. So we've sort of spun that on its head a little bit and done a lot of work around goal-oriented risk modeling and started to think about what does a system or an organization ultimately need to be successful to be operational? So that could be quite abstract from technology to people to uh, you know, ge geo geospatial um, uh, sort of stability. So, you know, things like natural disasters impact in that. Um, and then you can ask for all of those things, what does that depend on? Um, so again, for technology, it might be a supply of electricity. It might be a, uh, you know, function in uh, IT infrastructure. Again, each of those are quite high level. So you, again, you ask the dependency, what's the dependency there? What do you depend on again there? And you can keep going from the top down. And the longer you keep asking that question for, you slowly build up a dependency tree um, and top down. Um, that 
is effectively a, you can use it as a directed uh, cyclic graph, which, which then means that you can actually apply things like conditional probability to it and and uh, other other forms of statistics such that if something were to become cyber attacked way down in the dependency tree, you could change the probability of that goal being operational from say 95% to say 75% as you become aware of a DDoS attack, for example, on that. Then when you change that number from 95% to 75%, that will, because of the nature of the connected uh, dependency tree, propagate all the way back up through the tree and show you the impact on probability of all the other goals being successful, which will then give you a direct impact of your cyber attack on the rest of the organization. So we've done quite a bit of work in that space. Um, moving on to the middle box then. Uh, That's your TV work. Did your TV work all right? You watch it Sorry, a bit of. Uh, Sorry, guys, can you put yourself on the mute or let me just. That's okay, it's gone now. Uh, yeah, a bit of interference. So, yeah, moving on to the middle box around uh, governance and collective decision making. Uh, how do people make decisions? How do people make decisions under pressure? How do make people make decisions in groups? Um, and this sort of uh, is a sort of a hybrid between psychology and, and how humans make decisions and, and, and criminology in terms of who talks to who is in terms of social groups. Um, and playing into the sort of technical side as well. So through play incident response playbooks, uh, we've done a number of sort of different projects around that, um, which then feeds into the the, the last uh, box there, the last arrow, AI and ML for threat intelligence and automated cyber defense. Um, this is about using data from networks, from devices, uh, basically activity that you can measure in a digital environment to understand and distinguish between what is normal behavior uh, or what is good behavior and what is bad behavior and therefore potentially a cyber attack. Um, so uh, again, you, could, you, could, you know, we've done various bits of work and one of the examples I'll give today on this is, is how we've used machine learning to detect um, malware through system behavior. And uh, I'll give you an actual example of that. Um, this also includes attacks on machine learning models themselves. So, for example, if you're able to detect uh, ransomware through a machine learning model and then you deploy that on the front lines of frontline defense, that in itself is almost a new threat vector because uh, ultimately that, that's now protected your system and it is a data driven decision making system. So if the data itself is attacked, then that effectively can subvert the model, avoid detection through that model based approach and therefore get into your system. I don't know almost like evading uh, evading an antivirus almost. Um, yeah, so that's all part and parcel of, of that sort of AMR, AI and ML threat intelligence. So you'll notice though that the arrow then goes all the way back around to risk assessment and modeling. So what that means is ultimately, we're not just trying to say, hey, there's an attack on your system and the ML has said you, you're, you're subject to a DDoS attack or a ransomware attack. It's actually feeding that back into your risk model. So as I mentioned, you've got that goal-oriented model that can show the propagation of, of potential drop in probability of your uh, success of your organization by feeding into it information like, we think this subsystem is under threat or this particular device is under threat because we've detected the early stages uh, of a particular type of cyber attack. So it's trying to create that living, breathing model. So um, cutting through this, all of this is human factors, as I mentioned. So individual susceptibility to cyber attacks, motivations for cyber attacks, motivations to act in a secure way within an organization, trust and dynamics, again, within an organization with a security policy, but also between people and machine learning in that context of hybrid security operation centers um, and you know, automated cyber defense. And the social factors of cyber. Why, why would somebody do it? You know, launch a cyber attack. What might they try and do? Which sort of links in, into the criminology and the international sort of politics element, which helps sort of feed the data that you might use as features for your machine learning model, but also helps interpret your machine learning model. So if you've detected a cyber attack, how do you use the decision making process? What data were used? How did the machine learning model make this decision? And then can you then reverse from that? to who's doing it, why are they doing it, what are they doing? So you got some action of intelligence to, again, to feed into your risk model. Um, so cutting through all of it the other way. So top down is privacy and emerging tech. So privacy is a big area of research for us. So um, anonymization and privacy in data, location aware systems and uh, privacy in terms of location based systems, but also privacy in machine learning, you know, and the, uh, ensuring that there's no ability to uh, sort of reverse out who's 
data you've used or any particular identity uh, with regards um, machine learning decisions. And the emerging tech essentially is, is the element of, well, look, all of these darker blue boxes around risk, um, assessment, modeling, management, decision-making playbooks, AI and threat modeling. Um, we've sort of developed this for a range of different emerging tech from IoT to cloud to industry 4.0 connected autonomous vehicle. Uh, so very much looking at sort of this, how do we create this living, breathing, cyber threat awareness, situational awareness and response system automated as much as we can and integrated with the way people work to, 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 to secure systems. Um, so that's the that's the that's the sort of high level overview of of, of the work that we do in our uh, in our team. Um, we're very applied, I suppose, in the nature of what we do. Um, and this is exemplified with our, I suppose, our two flagship partnerships. We have a lot of industry partners that we work with on these topics, but our two flagship ones are with Airbus, where we have Airbus's only global center of excellence in cybersecurity analytics and also in human centric cybersecurity. Um, so, again, I suppose you can see their commitment there to really think about cybersecurity, both from the technical perspective and from the human perspective. Um, that's involved various student placements, secondments, funded research, et cetera. So it's quite a deep relationship. And Tales being another example where actually this is more about being outward facing and engaging the next generation of cyber professionals in the South Wales Valleys, um, trying to, I suppose, convey what digital exploitation looks like, what the career in that might look like in terms of um, cyber attack and defence. Uh, but also we're running a research, research uh, partnership around uh, particularly around operational technology, energy systems, manufacturing systems, um, again, connected autonomous vehicles, very, very different types of protocols, different types of devices and understanding cyber attacks on those. A lot of legacy based systems there as well. Um, yeah, OK, so that's a high level overview of, of where we started. So I'll, I'll move on now to talk a little bit about some of the, the, the research that we do, I'll give it an exact, a concrete example of that AI and threat-based cyber attack modeling. Um, so a case study being Advanced Security Operations Center or SOC uh, at Airbus. Um, so this work started sort of five, six years ago now with, with a challenge that was posed to us that um, advanced, advanced persistent threats or APTs are becoming increasingly sophisticated. Um, so traditional antivirus systems are, are becoming less effective because a lot of the identifiable features such as code that you'd normally use um, to detect uh, malware through, say, antivirus and uh, code matching um, uh, is being overcome in terms of the attacker's perspective and detection through encryption, custom code bases, in-memory execution and so on. So it hides a lot of what it's doing and what it is, if that makes sense. So it's harder to detect. So this was a sort of challenge that Airbus posed. But there was a paper then around 20... Again, about 25, 2015, 2016, um, it was called the Big Four, uh, and it was actually analysing the Big Big Four APTs at the time. Um, and it was saying, look, surely we can do better, basically, because um, if you want to do anything on a computer network, on an IT infrastructure or an OT infrastructure, you need to engage with the system, the devices. It's going to leave a footprint. You, you can't hide what you do. Um, you're going to have to leave a footprint behind. So um, we sort of picked that up and used this concept of low severity events, things that are inevitably generated while an executable is running in an environment. So things like CPU use, system use, RAM use, swap use, receive packets in and out of the network, sent packets in and out of the network, the number of processes running, et cetera. So you can't really hide those. Those are things that are always going to be collected from a system. And our sort of hypothesis was that we can use these to, to, to determine what is good behavior and what is bad behavior, right? So um, the, the the premise was that we we could create effectively DNA profiles of malware, um, and why that's important is because um, while uh, you know a code base might be restructured or might be encrypted or might, you know might do the activity it's going to do in different ways in different sequences, um, ultimately it's going to leave a similar footprint because it's doing similar things to what the code was doing. You know, its actual interaction with the network before it was. Um, changed in any way so the the dna concept being that if you have you know two family members uh you're going to have a very similar dna match because that's the composition that's how it is um so our, our, our was our sort of premise and then so our, our next question was how on earth do we do this 
Um, so what you can see on the left of the screen there is the machine activity data that we collected for a period of five minutes by running it in a sandbox environment, so a cuckoo sandbox environment. And you can see, I mean, I guess the time is the, you know, the clear indicator there that it goes from zero to the end of the period and it, and it gets uh, higher in its, in its numbers as it goes along. You can see for things like processes, CPU, system use, memory use, et cetera, though, um, that that changes. It fluctuates over time. It, it goes up, it goes down. And you can also see um, that in this particular case that there's not a lot of network activities and nothing really comes in or goes out of the network. So this would look very different for one piece of or well, one executable uh, to another executable. So the principle was to run thousands of these samples um, in the sandbox environment for five minutes, which we did. So we collected 2,000 malicious samples and 2,000 benignware samples, and we ran these and collected this traffic for five minutes, this behavior for five minutes, uh, which ended up with a massive data set, as you can imagine. So the, the approach we chose then to take was to try and say, right, well, OK, I, I, what, you know, how can we actually create something that will clearly cluster similar things together, but will also leave enough of a, a fringe to be able to um, have sort of broadly similar things that end up in, in like a fuzzy boundary, if, I, if you like, on the, uh, on the edge of those things that are very, very similar. Um, so to give, um, I suppose, an example of this in the bottom right corner, you've got the, a box on the left, which has got many, many colors and a box on the right where those colors are clustered into similar colors. Um, you've got clear green, clear red, clear blue, clear yellow, and then stuff on the periphery stuff that's not quite green, not quite blue, not quite yellow, not quite green, stuff in between. That's your fuzzy boundaries. So a way to do this is to use, um, I, I, of course, there are multiple, uh, but one way to do this is to use self-organizing feature maps, which is effectively a competitive learning algorithm. You plot your first seed data point at random. You plot another data point on the uh, on the map as well. Um, and effectively, the what you can see here is a, I guess this is about a 20 by 20 grid. So each of those um, is a, a node or a unit. Um, and you plot the first data point in any of those units. The second one will probably be fairly close by because it's as close as it's going to be. The more you add the, the next data points to the map, though, the more it will learn that some things are similar. So they'll stay in proximal nodes or units and others that are different will end up getting pushed away to other parts of the map so then what you end up with again using this color example is your greens and your reds and your blues will stick together if you'd say for example the, the, the features were um rgb values here you, you'd end up with these clusters forming very firmly and then the the, the, the buffers around the edge of it so self-organizing feature maps was an approach that we took to do this and we took thousands of samples. So you can see here the thousands of samples um, plotted on the good behavior, which is the top map, and the bad behavior, which is the bottom map, um, the malware. And then for each new sample, so you've got an example now of a, of a new executable coming in. We measured the behavior every second, and we had the algorithm make a choice as to whether it best fitted what unit on what map. And then it would plot it as it's doing now. So you can immediately see that there are some brighter areas on these maps. The brighter areas are the more frequently seen good activity in the green one, and the more frequently seen bad activity in the in the red one. And you can almost then, almost by eye, just see here that the data points that are landing on the good and bad maps suggest already that it's probably going to be something that's malicious because the the data points are landing on the green map in areas that haven't really been seen so much before and on the bad map in areas that are probably looking quite malicious based on where, what we've seen before. But actually, the, these were almost just a feature transfer, a data transformation activity. So we took all of our continuous metrics from CPU use, RAM use, et cetera, uh, bytes and packets in and out, and we transformed them into effectively what was an X, Y coordinate then on these maps. Um, so the X, Y coordinate then became a new feature vector that we used to uh, feed into a, a voting machine learning algorithm that used those as features to make a decision. So it would actually it would effectively take the the continuous data out of the equation, refactor it into a, a sort of a this DNA profile and then use the features of the DNA profile to make the decision. Um, and this actually worked uh, very well. It had a 94 percent classification um, F measure, actually, to be precise, rather than accuracy. Um, although it was a balanced data set, so accuracy is also fine. Um, 94% was 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 good. And actually, we compared that to some of the state-of-the-art methods, and it was an improvement. Um, so great. Brilliant. Now we're able to sort of take this and say, yeah, we're able to detect um, 
different types of malware uh, using you know this behavioral based approach, which doesn't depend on a direct code analysis, which is what normal antivirus systems do. Uh, okay, so that's fine, but it took five minutes to make that decision. Um, so five minutes to make a decision is okay. Yeah, fine. At least you know it's now there, but now you're in remediation mode because you know that an attack has taken place on your system and you've got to do something about it, um, which is a bit of a pain. At least you know. Yeah, okay, good. Um, but you now have to act on it. But if this is something like ransomware, then you're a bit stuffed because by five minutes, all your files are encrypted. It's too late. So all well and good saying, yeah, we think there's some ransomware on the system, but by five minutes, it's all encrypted. So the next piece of our work was to think about, OK, so we, we can we know that in five minutes we can determine that something is malicious or benign with quite high accuracy. How can we do that a bit earlier? So we started investigating the use of recurrent neural networks. Um, so, uh, you know, to cut out the deep technical stuff, um, recurrent neural networks effectively have a, a form of memory that allow you to model sequences over time. They can sort of determine what is expected to come next within a certain distance of what we've just seen. Um, and so we thought, OK, so so let's use that approach then and the recurrent neural network. If we can model these events over time to maybe say, well, we've seen the first three seconds. And based on that, we would expect that maybe at 10 seconds is getting close to something that's malicious. And then we can sort of make decisions at 10 seconds as to whether something's malicious. 20 seconds, 30 seconds, a minute, two minutes, three minutes, four minutes and five minutes and work out well, what's the optimum here? Where Where are we? You know, if we make a decision at two seconds, probably going to be way off the mark. But maybe we can get the two and a half minutes and then it's two and a half minutes faster than the five minutes. Maybe we can get it to a minute. So we made a decision on whether something was malicious or benign every second for five minutes. Right. So uh, I've got a bit of a demo here I can show actually of um, the, the nodes here, are the various uh, input points so processes, CPU use, et cetera, et cetera. A new file would be fed in. And you can see on the right hand side, the neural network is making a decision every second as to how confident it is that something is malicious or benign. 100% confident straight down, 100% uh, a benign, sorry, straight up like this one here. 100% malicious, it would point straight down. If it's 50-50 like it is now, it'd be in the middle. So obviously you don't want to be making choices as to whether something is malicious or benign if it's 50-50. You want to wait for it to become a bit more confident as you've just seen then. But actually, in many cases, as you can see here, the, the decision is uh, known or there's confidence in that decision quite early. So the, the plot here is every second. Um, so you can see in this instance, um, yeah, it's pretty confident pretty early that this is malicious. Um, and yeah, it turns out that it is a malicious file. Um, so this one is another example where it's very confident very early on within second, within two seconds that it's benign and yeah, it's benign. So obviously we played this out for the full five minutes to check this, but then we thought, well, let's do some comparative analysis and work out what the, you know, what the best results actually are. Um, so uh, in this case, we were actually able to determine that something was malicious with 95% accuracy, still retaining that accuracy within, within five seconds. So actually the first five seconds of behavior was enough to determine that something was malicious. So actually we've now gone from five minutes down to five seconds with still high accuracy in determining things are malicious. Great. So quite a big step forward, a significant step change. If you think about the potential for this now as a as an endpoint protection mechanism, um, you can actually detect stuff uh, almost in real time. So um, I'll come back to uh, what we do about that shortly, but I just want to touch before I move on to that um, on on that point that I just made about end, endpoint uh, protection. So. Um, the next the next question is well there's two next questions for this is is one what do you do once you've actually detected something within five seconds can you actually act on that and that's something i'll uh, i'll come to next the other one is if you're going to deploy this on an endpoint will it actually work in practice uh which is obviously quite a significant question um so we thought well what we'll do is we'll actually test this we've trained our models and what we'll do now is we'll test this on an unseen data set that is collected after the, the all, where all the all the samples were collected after the point at which we trained our models. So this is both an unseen data set and, in theory, different ways of operating. So different types of how it interacts and runs on the system because obviously things move on over time. So what we wanted to test here was this 
this concept of whether whether the you know the models will work and have longevity and continue to form over time. But then there was another thing we wanted to test as well was this concept of machine metrics that we would use. I mean, we, we were one of the first to, to use machine activity metrics here. 99% um, ish of the academic literature in machine learning for cyber attack detection at this point used um, system API calls, um, which makes sense. You know, again, it's sort of the same premise of uh, if you're interacting with the system, you need to do something. Calling an API call makes a lot of sense. That's always going to have to happen. Um, but the issue we have with the API calls is, that, again, that changes over time and you're quite inconsistent. So if you were to have a feature vector, so the things that you're measuring are all API calls, that's going to end up being quite sparse because you're not going to have many API calls in there, actually, for one particular piece of malware, whereas your machine activity is going to be complete. You're always going to have machine activity. So the principle was, you know, is the sparse matrix of API calls likely to last and be, perform in the same way as um, machine metrics? So what you can see here then is three separate models. They're all using executable files. You've got um, you've got a random forest on the left. You've got an SVM model in the middle, and you've got a neural network model uh, on the right. Um, the blue dots are the performance of uh, many runs of training in the model and testing in the model. Um, so you can see that all the models actually perform, you know, above eighty percent, which is good. Um, and you can actually see that, uh, but what, what you can actually see that here though, is that the the difference in, um, so let me explain each chart. So you've got the three separate charts. One is a random forest, one is an SVM, one is a neural network. And within each chart, you've got three separate readings. Um, the API call results, which is on the left-hand side, the machine activity results, which is in the middle, and the two of them combined, which is on the right of each chart. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. So what we can see from this is the orange dots are the unseen uh, data set collected later after we'd already trained the model that we were using to test the model on. So what you can see for the AP, it says take the first one, the, the, the random forest one on the left hand side, you can see the AP, API calls perform well initially, blue dots, drop right off with the orange dots. For the machine metrics, you can see it's fairly stable. It drops down a little bit with the orange dots from the maximum blue dot, but it's fairly stable. And actually combining them doesn't help either because it because of the API calls, it drops lower than you would expect to see with the um, with the machine metrics alone. And actually, this is fairly consistent. So if you look at the middle model um, with the SVM, you see the same. Um, and if you look at the neural network, again, you broadly see the same. The API calls drop off in performance with an unseen data set while the uh, machine activity metric broadly uh, are holding. Now, this is quite a significant finding because, as I said, 95 to 99 percent of the academic literature was still using API calls at this point. And we can clearly see that you can't really deploy this on frontline defenses because it's going to be out of date very, very quickly. And the machine activity metrics actually suggest here that we can we can hold our own. We can we can continue to still be valid and still detect things um, much later on. Uh, I think it was about six months later we did this experiment with 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 unseen data set that was collected much much later. So the second part. So in, in the answer to the first question, then you know I think actually it suggests that the the more promising approach for um, real time endpoint detection is uh, to use machine metrics, not API calls. Um, okay, good. So so then that brings us to our second question, which is, okay, so we've we've shown that machine metrics are pretty good actually um at um detecting different types of malware um moreover they actually stand the test of time um in that you can collect something six months later and run that through it and it's still pretty good in terms of its accuracy okay good um and we've reduced the detection from five minutes to five seconds great um but again what are we doing with that you know if we just put an alert on some sort of um seam or in a you know security operations center and we say look your your, your, your system's under attack our, our machine learning model has said within five seconds that we're 95 percent accuracy is a ransomware attack well by the time anyone looks at that five minutes will have passed anyway so you haven't really got any any advantage by doing the early detection because it's still take you're still relying on a human to respond so the um the next bit of research that we did was to think about all right so how can we do automated response how can we actually do something about this so if you look at the um 
the 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 a dot exe b dot exe c dot exe part of the image what we're basically saying is a dot exe is a is a malicious process that that spawns two two child processes b and c um and they're running and they keep running so let's take for example d e and f same thing d is a malicious process spawns e spawns f so the principle that we started to apply here was to say right well okay so let's capture individual processes as they start and monitor those um, and have uh, a, a, effectively a threshold that says, right, so we're this confident that this process is malicious. And when you reach that threshold, actually kill the underlying process. Um, so this is what we did. Uh, um, and we ran that again. We ran, ran the samples through again. Um, and as well as actually capturing the system activity on uh, uh, and using it for our um, RNN model, um, we, were, we were also thinking about the, the threshold of the activity for that particular process. And when it reached a certain threshold, killing that process. So with D, E and F, for example, D has started, it started to do some damage. So is E, but almost by the time F starts, it's already stopped. Um, but again, within within five seconds, we're able to stop everything. You know, a, a call, obviously taking into account the, 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 the false positive rate we're seeing as well. So we we actually ran this then with a ransomware case study because why not you know it makes makes the most sense doesn't it in terms of the the fast acting nature of the the type of cyber attack and we found that actually in doing this we were able to um, reduce file encryption by ninety two percent in in this example of ransomware um, ninety percent of those ransomware samples were detected and by the way the model wasn't even trained on ransomware we deliberately left ransomware out of the trained model and it was still able to detect it. Um, uh, we did have, though, of course, a, f uh, a false positive rate of um, 14 percent. Which probably does preclude it from being used as an, as an endpoint solution at the moment, because we well, imagine 14 percent of the, what was happening on your computer system was killed incorrectly, probably end up not being able to do very much. Um, so it's quite uh, quite problematic. So we're working on that now. Uh, we actually have a, a project that's looking at what are those 14% uh, in terms of processes, you know, the background processes are the critical processes, what's the impact of the 14% at the same time, of course, as trying to refine this model to reduce the 14% false positive rate while still increasing the uh, number of files detected and, uh, you know, reducing the, the file encryption. But this means we can actually do something with it. You know, it brings, it brings the whole concept of machine learning for cyber attack detection to life and we can actually do cyber defense um, and there are other elements here now you have to consider that the follow on from this for example how do you convey that this is happening to a security operation center and how do they pass that up the chain to their commercial directors and their and their business directors in terms of the potential business impact on the system of making an incorrect decision this is quite important um, but again this is where we can evolve it i mean i think um, one of the key takeaways, I suppose, from me is that look, the machine learning isn't a silver bullet to solve cyber attack uh, concerns, um, but equally, it, it is also very promising. Uh, you know, I think there's a lot of a lot of the discussion is that oh, this is never going to do anything. It's never going to work. Um, and I think well, I've just what I've just demonstrated is a whole body of scientific research that actually shows yeah, it can work. Can work. It, it works very specifically in particular areas like ransomware. It clearly works well for. Um, and it can work in other areas as well. So I think it's on us and on you, know, well, you, the researchers who are listening to to pick this up and sort of think about, well, what other questions do we need to ask and build the evidence and the scientific scientific body of knowledge to to convince people that that, that this is actually a you know a viable approach to to, to, to cyber defense in depth. Uh, so, yeah, so moving on to the point about how secure is this security? Um, as I said earlier, the problem with putting machine learning as a cyber attack defense mechanism is it, it introduces actually a new threat vector to your um, uh, to your organization in that um, can you avoid detection from this ransomware detection model? Uh, and what we're finding is, yes, you can. Um, so in this example, I've got malicious um, and benign processes uh, captured on the left hand side here, which is um, uh, apologies for the red and green. It's, it's not the best for color blindness, but if you if you can see it, you get there's actually clusters of benign activity and clusters of malicious activity um, here. Um, they're not all clustered together. There are gaps between them and they're sort of intermingled, but you can clearly see how it'd be reasonably straightforward for an algorithm to determine the boundaries of what is malicious and what is benign, because there, there, there are quite clear boundaries between them, even though they're interwoven. 
So what we started to do then is to start to manipulate the data um, and and the sort of add additional padding into it, if you like. Um, so some some additional uh, clean activity, some additional malicious activity, um, and start to try and confuse the algorithm. And what you can see on the right hand side is that actually it's still pretty good at detecting the benign activity, but the um, identified adversarial activity, which are the blue dots. Um, are far less than they were in the previous one, the red malicious dots, and the blue, light blue crosses are unidentified adversarial attacks. So this is where we've manipulated the data of an actual piece of malware, and it's become unidentifiable by the algorithm because, as you can see, it's hidden in and among the benign activity. The decision boundaries are no longer as clear as they were which is clearly problematic. And another area that we're currently looking at at the moment is to have, how to harden these models to either become aware of um, adversarial manipulation, so the data being manipulated and flag it as such, um, or build the models in such a way that it's much more difficult to confuse them. So they don't you don't end up with these crosses integrated into the benign and, they, and it's very much easier for them to distinguish benign um, from malicious, whether it includes adversarial or not. So that's another research challenge, actually. There's lots of work still to do in this space. Um, so then we actually did a, an analysis then of, of actually understanding how, how does this adversarial uh, manipulation actually affect um, machine learning performance? Uh, we actually, this, this example actually comes from an operational technology um, in, uh, intrusion detection system. So a, a manufacturing system where we developed a, a machine learning approach to cyber attack detection. And we were manipulating the data going into it to try and confuse the algorithm. So um, this is using JSMA. So effectively, that infers the features that are most relevant to an ML decision. So it tries to identify those the features in the decision boundaries and then takes a percentage of those features and pertur perturbs them by a certain amount of noise. And obviously, the goal is to take the minimum amount of features and perturb it by the minimum amount of noise. Um, the sort of baseline we had on this intrusion detection system was a 0.8 F1F score. So not quite as good as the uh, ransomware stuff, but because of the different protocols and different activities in OT systems, this is still pretty, pretty, pretty good result. Um, we did the adversarial manipulation. And what you can see in the diagrams, the images at the bottom on the left hand side is the image, um, the results during an adversarial attack on an intrusion detection system deployed on that industrial control system. And you can see it's dropped significantly from 0.81 down to like in some cases 0.5 ish late 0.5s some are still holding in the 0.65s um so yeah quite quite an impact uh you know and that's that's quite concerning so what we then did was say right okay so what were the what were the more successful approaches to inferring these features and what were the more successful features that were selected and, and perturbed and we actually used this data then to train the model again so that it was able to actually weed out this is malicious, this is benign, and this is adversarial malicious or adversarial benign. It was able to determine actually yeah, what we're seeing here is some data manipulation. Um, and in doing that, you can see the diagram on the right there, we've pushed across the board. Um, into, so the, the, the axes there are, um, I should have mentioned, sorry, the, 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 the amount that you've perturbed. Um, and the number of features you've perturbed. Um, it doesn't really matter then when it comes to the diagram on the right, that doesn't matter how many features you perturb or how much you perturb them by, it's staying fairly solid at about 0.76, which is only actually a small drop on the 0.81. So there are ways to secure these systems from adversarial attacks, but the principle is, and I guess the takeaway message is you need to consider this. You can't just drop stuff um, and deploy it on the front line. This longer term maintenance is really actually quite important. Um, uh, and so, of course, another issue here is how often do you do this? How often does you know your re or does your trained your original trained model or your retrained model um, actually need retraining? Whether it be just generally or from an adversarial context to make sure that it's still holding that uh, that performance accuracy. So another thing to to think about there and. Um, more broadly, this falls into concept drift that I'm not going to uh, cover today, but the, it's worth looking at the, the the principle of concept drift for your work to think about what that means for machine learning uh, algorithms in this context. So my last point um, is, uh, is thinking about these results. So all these results, I suppose, look good in theory on paper, 
But again, to come back to the scientific inquiry point, we need to be careful about what we're interpreting. Um, and I had a PhD student uh, who's uh, finished recently, Matthew Nunes, who um, actually ended up building a, uh, a system to capture the, the kernel level uh, calls, kernel level API calls to go with the, the user level API calls on a system. Um, to start being able to interpret, as I said, I've already shown you that these are not the most sustainable uh, um, in terms of longevity of detecting cyber attacks over time. But what they do give you is a very clear message as to what the machine is, what's happening on the machine. You know, is it creating a new process? Is it opening a new file? Is it writing? So, you know, you, you can get some very detailed information on this. So his, his question was, all right, so let's put the performance aside for a minute. Let's actually try and understand what's going on in the machine learning classification process. What are these features that are being detected in malware? What are the features that are being detected in proce processware, uh, in benignware, sorry. Um, and again, he did this with multiple thousands of, of, of malicious and benign samples. And one, one of his really interesting findings was that the malware um, was being classified as malware. Um, in in many cases, actually, by using an API call that was trying to determine whether the executable was actually inside uh, a sandbox, so whether it was actually in a virtualized environment. The, I, I guess the hypothesis there is it's it's doing so. Uh, it's, it's it's looking to uh, to understand its surroundings to determine whether it's in a virtualized environment, and if it is, it might not do what it tends to do. So that it, it hides itself if it knows it's being monitored, if that makes sense, which is we know that happens. So but what that means then, though, is that it, it adds another question into the equation of, OK, so actually, if if our or certainly on an API call perspective, if the API calls that are being used to determine something malicious is the fact that the uh, the executable itself is looking for a virtualized environment, you're not actually using the maliciousness of that executable to detect its presence you're using something completely different um which is it's just an interesting thought to think about what you know what what it actually means to detect this stuff and what features are you using to detect it and in an actual case that the maliciousness of the um of the model was was not actually uh, detecting anything uh, so the malicious the maliciousness of the model the malicious side of the model was not necessarily using the malicious activity. It wasn't detecting malicious activity. It was actually detecting that it was looking whether it was in a sandbox. So, again, an interesting point to, to consider. Um, so references in there. I'll send the slides later um, or you can screenshot it now up to you. But all of these papers I've talked about there are all you can go and read the, the, the details of those um, at your leisure. I haven't gone into any of the technical stuff because you can read it in the paper. I just explained the principles of what we're doing and some of the interpretation of it. Hopefully it's given you some ideas as well for what you might be able to do for your own research. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Pete. Um, questions? I'll kick off if I can. Thanks, Pete. Great talk. Uh, incredibly interesting. And um, just interested to know your view about kind of the role of trustworthy AI and explainable AI. Do you see that as an important consideration within? Yeah, yeah. so that's an interesting topic for the discussion at the moment, actually, is, 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 is trustworthy AI. Um, so a lot of people, as you say, are going towards visualization uh, with that, uh, and, and that makes sense. But actually, I've spoken to a few people in